My God is a God who saves. From the Sovereign Lord comes escape from death. Amen. Martin Luther was not alone when he died in the middle of the night. There were others in his room. They remembered the things that he said. But he wasn't talking to the people much in the room. Martin Luther wasn't alone in a different relationship. He prayed to the Lord. And the words I just spoke, my God is a God who saves. That was one of the Bible verses on Martin Luther's lips just before he died. For dying Luther, he knew that death took him away from lots of different things, but there was one very important relationship that remained. And that was his relationship with his Lord. There's an aged king who is on his deathbed after many years of providing and, and protecting and taking care of his people. His son was at his bedside on his deathbed and he said to him, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. So be strong and walk in the way of the Lord. King David counseled Solomon in his relationship with the Lord because King David, as he was dying, knew that there was one thing that remained. Your relationship with the Lord. Do you remember the death of Stephen? After Jesus had risen and ascended, Stephen is giving witness to his faith before the Sanhedrin, all these religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees and teachers of the law and the Sadducees, and they rejected him. They cut off any relationship that was good with Stephen, picked up their stones, dragged him outside to stone him to death. But for dying Stephen, he knew that there was one relationship that remained. And he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. I have been at the deathbed of loved ones in my life. And it's interesting how death takes away all the distractions. Suddenly it's just very clear what matters in life and what doesn't. What lasts in life and what doesn't. Life suddenly boils down to its clear purpose that this is our time of grace. This is my time to learn of God and his love. And this is my time to trust in him before I die. And death separates you from so much. That's the terror of it. That's the trouble of it. it. Separates you from basically everything. But it cannot separate you from God. Today, Jesus teaches us of the resurrection. When you hear resurrection, think relationship. The Sadducees did not teach the resurrection. And this is Holy Week where we have this lesson. Jesus is about to be crucified and then we know Easter Sunday afterwards, right? This is a busy time in the temple courts. Lots of people were gathered in the streets of Jerusalem for this Holy Week in anticipation of the Passover to come. And Jesus was really popular as he's teaching. So all of the religious leaders are taking their shots at Jesus, coming up with their best, like, anti-popularity method they can have with Jesus. Pharisees, teachers of the law, and here the Sadducees, they have a joke they want to share in front of the people. They want to make the resurrection look absolutely ridiculous, but they'll do it in a respectable way. Teacher, what about this? Help us with, oh yeah, help us with it. If they want to laugh about it. So let's come up with something ridiculous. There's this law of Moses that if a brother dies who's married, if your brother died and he's married and childless, a brother in his family would marry his wife. So you'd keep the family name going. So Jesus, what if there were seven brothers and the first one died childless, then the next one marries her and he dies there childless still and the next one and the next one and the next one. So this is kind of funny. Whose husband is she going to be at the resurrection? Can you picture the comic, in the, the cartoon in your newspaper coming out from the Sadducees? 
You've got seven guys, seven brothers, standing there with one bride before the pearly gates, and there's God scratching your head, yeah, you got me here, I have no idea what to do with this family. Ha ha, really funny, and that's the way it goes with the teaching of the resurrection. There is no earthly proof, there is no evidence in our lives that when you die, something happens, that, something, that life continues. The afterlife is just kind of a blank page for people. They feel comfortable coming up with and writing and teaching whatever they want, like a blank page. Put whatever you want there and it's just fine, because you can't prove to me otherwise. But like all things with our faith, and especially on this topic, the Word speaks. The Word. The truth. Jesus fills up that page. And it's my prayer that you and I would take His words today, frame them and hang them on the walls of our minds and our hearts so that when we are on our deathbed, they will be there before my eyes. The words of my Jesus, the promise of my Savior when it comes to the resurrection. And these are His words. The people of this age marry and are given in marriage. In this life, people of this world, this is how it goes. You get married, you have kids, you die, they get married, they have kids, they die, generation to generation, boom, boom, boom. That's the way it works in this world. But the next life is different, and Jesus can talk about this as only Jesus can do. The next life will be different. Those who are considered worthy of taking part in the age to come and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage. And they can no longer die. They'll be like the angels. Angels are not married. We're all in the family of God. And angels do not die. They are God's children, Jesus says, since they are children of the resurrection. Does it strike you as it strikes me that when Jesus teaches us about the resurrection and when he teaches the Sadducees about the resurrection, he doesn't talk about the rising of all souls, believers and unbelievers, to immortality. He doesn't just teach, oh, the soul is immortal and that's true for believers and unbelievers. He talks about the resurrection, not a resurrection. True life, what it means to really be alive, to be resurrected in the fullest sense, is to have life with God forever, a relationship with God forever. When you hear resurrection, think relationship. So what is hell? The soul still exists in hell. Life goes on in hell. We call it eternal death, kind of an oxymoron, but it endures forever. The death part is that you are cut off from he who is the life. You're cut off from God, and that is not true life. That is not the resurrection. You're cut off from God and all of his blessings for eternity. That is hell. Jesus talks about the true resurrection. Those who are considered worthy of life from the dead. Those who are considered worthy. Who's considered worthy? Who does the considering? God does. And even there, you realize that the resurrection has something to do with God. It's not just me, it's not just a soul living on, but it has to do with a relationship because God is doing the considering. So at the heart of the resurrection, you have God and his relation to man. Who is considered worthy? The question is this, does God consider me worthy of taking part in that life? I love that question. Not because I'm full of myself and I think I'm a perfect pastor. I'm wearing a white robe, but I know I'm a sinner. I don't like the question, does God consider me worthy for that reason, but because the question isn't, am I worthy? Am I worthy? Are you worthy of taking part in the resurrection? That when I die, I would say, that resurrection is mine? Not. You and I are born in sin, and every hour we add to our lives further evidence of that fact. We must confess we're just like that prodigal son who comes back to his father and says, 
I am not worthy to be called your child. Not worthy. But what's the question here? Does God consider you worthy? I'd have to look in the Bible for that. What does God tell me? He does. Through Jesus. That God has made room in his house for other children besides his one and only son. And he did it through that son. God has made room in his house for adopted children of God by sending Jesus as the son with whom he was well pleased in my place to take upon himself all of the sin and guilt that I earned in my unworthiness before him. And it's all gone as he pays the punishment on my behalf and says, you are worthy. You are saints of God. You are my children. There is room in my house for other people by this because I say in my word that whoever believes in my son has eternal life. Whoever believes in my son is one of my family. Whoever I put my name on them in baptism, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you belong to me. Purchased through the blood of Jesus, I bought you. Does God consider me worthy? Oh, yes, he does. Am I worthy? Oh, no, I'm not. But he considers me worthy for Jesus' sake. I am a child of God and therefore a child of the resurrection. I'm a child of the 80s, too. Generation X, I guess, the tail end of it. We use those expressions, don't we? People say, I'm a child of the -the fill-in-the-blank era or I'm a child of this, or a child. we have that in our English language. Jesus says we're children of the resurrection. So just as I can say, I'm a child of the 80s, I was born in the 80s, I lived in the 80s, so I have a connection, I have a relation to life in the 1980s. So we can say, with the confidence of faith, I have a connection, I am related, I have a relationship with the resurrection. That at my day, when everything is falling apart and all of things of life are being stripped away from me, there's something that's still connected to me because I'm a child of the resurrection. It's still a part of my life. And that is the power of God to raise the dead. That I will have my time to be made alive. That the Lord Jesus will transform my lowly body to be like his glorious body. I have a share in that. I have a part in that. You take this truth today to your deathbed, to comfort yourself as children of God that you are also children of the resurrection and will share in the new heavens and the new earth that Jesus promises for you today. When you hear resurrection, think relationship that never ends. And to underscore this point, Jesus goes back to Exodus. The Sadducees only recognized the first five books as the most authoritative books from God. So he goes straight to the heart of their own literature and says, even Moses shows this, that the dead rise. Even Moses showed that the dead rise, for he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. How, how about that? For picturing the resurrection as a relationship with God. Most people in the world knew that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were long dead, and Moses would know that. But this is the reality that because of their relationship to God, the God of Abraham, the God of Abraham was talking to Moses and could also look Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in their risen eyes. At the same time, he was still their God. They were still his saints. Now and forever. You know that story of the burning bush? where God speaks to Moses, the bush is on fire, it's a miracle, a bush is on fire, but it doesn't burn up. And so Jesus presents this miracle in his word that I am, I am, not I was, I am the God of Abraham. That's a miracle. They're still with me, face to face, living in my presence. And that is the most beautiful picture of heaven you, could, you and I could ever ask for. There are lots of beautiful pictures of heaven. We had some in our readings today. Descriptions in the Bible of the new heavens and the new earth. But the greatest one 
is that God is still my God forever. Lord, you I love with all my heart. I pray you ne'er from me depart. With tender mercies cheer me. Earth has no treasure I would share. Heaven itself were void and bare. If you, Lord, were not near me. The most beautiful truth of eternal life is that God is still and always my God. You can't ask for a better picture than to be with the Lord forever and have his word the children of God are children of the resurrection. Your forefathers, your ancestors who believed, are still with the Lord. They stand in His presence. They see His face always. Fill in the blank. God is... My grandpa's God. God is my grandmother's God. God is the God of all believers. Fill in the blank with your name. And let that be your comfort. When you hear resurrection, think relationship. Someday, death may terrify you in that it's going to strip away from you just about everything it can in this life. But nothing can take you away from him. Amen. Would you please stand?